state of Wisconsin versus Stephen Avery. Stephen Avery knows the justice system and its injustices. In 2003, Avery became a household name in Wisconsin after his exoneration for a rape he didn't commit. In 2005, he became a national headline when he was charged with murdering a young photographer. Today, Avery's an international cause after making a murderer question the fairness of the trial that resulted in his murder conviction. Have you ever planted any evidence against Mr. Avery? That's ridiculous. Avery's defense to put the cops who investigated him on trial. Avery argued they framed him for the murder of Teresa Halbach in revenge. He'd recently sued their department for $36 million, $2 million for each of the 18 years he served for that rape he didn't commit. Exhibit A. When we defended him, we were the bad guys. A decade and a hit documentary later, Avery's attorneys have achieved folk hero status, and amateur attorneys across the country are retrying the case. Poor people lose. Poor people lose all the time. In Making a Murderer, Avery suggests he doesn't get justice because he's poor. This was not a poor man's uh, legal team. Dean Strang and uh, Jerry Buting are fantastic lawyers. But prosecutor Ken Kratz notes Avery's defense was among the best money can buy. After Halbach's murder, Avery settled his lawsuit for $400,000. Much of that went to hire a duo of legal rock stars. It was a fable, an ugly, horrific fable. Dean Strang, a high-profile attorney who won a case in the U.S. Supreme Court. Case over, because you can't rely on anything else they have given you. Jerry Buting, another big name in criminal defense, won new trials in state and federal courts. You had these uh, really talented defense attorneys. If there was a defense that was going to be raised, these were the two guys to do it. But that, I think, is what made this case so fair. Kratz headed Avery's prosecution team, which included its own heavy hitters. Do you know... Tom Fallon, the highly respected litigator from the Department of Justice. Did you find EDTA in the tube of blood of Stephen Avery? And Norm Gahn, one of the country's DNA pioneers, the first to charge unidentified rapists using their DNA profiles instead of their names. But Making a Murderer didn't focus on them. It highlighted the friction between Prosecutor Kratz and Avery's attorneys, even before the trial started. If you knew Ms. Halbach before she was killed, it's our suggestion that you not listen to this press conference. In this highly emotional news conference, Kratz detailed the torrid confession of Avery's nephew and alleged accomplice. Teresa Halbach is begging Brendan for her life. Stephen Avery at this point invites his 16-year-old nephew to sexually assault this woman and he's had bound to the bed. The defense argued this poisoned the jury pool with facts that were never introduced at trial. Kratz says he was just informing the public about the state's biggest ever prosecution, that it was the defense that decided to keep a local jury. They wanted a jury that was biased on their favor, and that would be all of the information about Stephen Avery's uh, exoneration, all the information about having been wrongfully convicted, and all of the biases that went with that from law enforcement standpoint. Whenever you lose at the trial, you question everything. You know, you second guess a lot of decisions that you made. But that particular one, it, you know, I mean, you were here, you were going through that. It, everybody in the state was biased against Stephen Avery because of that press conference. I'm an innocent man. There's no reason for me to testify. Everybody knows I'm innocent. But the jury convicted, and Avery is serving a life sentence. If pre-trial publicity was Avery's damnation, his attorney hopes all this post-trial publicity will be his salvation. I didn't know that it would grip the world the way it has. And I, I think, you know, we just need to sustain it to the point where some, some good comes out of it.